We've had a task force going on this morning discussing various issues on diplomacy for the Facebook era. We started at 10 o'clock and we've been going on sort of continuously till now. I'll just give you a brief idea of the topics we've covered, then uh, I'll introduce uh, each of the presenters. Um, we've uh, discussed uh, issues like what's right and wrong with current diplomacy. We don't want to throw everything away that exists, but we are looking to the future. We've looked at what limitations there are um, to traditional diplomatic platforms, traditional ways of doing diplomacy and how they impact governments and outreach beyond governments. We've looked at uh, the big new challenges to um, governments and diplomacy. Of course, they're not only challenges in the, that area, but things like transnational threats, um, global issues, the role of non-state actors, obviously international NGOs, global business, technology, social networking. We've tried to address um, also the way diplomacy can and should respond to those um, developments. And we have begun uh, discussing some practical um, options for reform, uh, some of which are already in the pipeline, already developing, some of which would be perhaps at this stage a step too far. Uh, we are trying to concentrate our discussions and any follow-up we have on, on practical solutions. Um, so if I may, I'll, I'll introduce um, Ambassador Paul Heinbecker and Dr. Catherine Kluver and Dr. Bruce Jones. I think you have uh, their distinguished resumes. Uh, they will each uh, introduce some salient topics that uh, they think are important to the debate. And then if we could open it to, to Q&As. I think there is going to be a microphone which you can use. Uh, and when you ask the question, if you could uh, just give your name and uh, where you're from, that would be very helpful. So, um, Ambassador Heinbecker, perhaps if you would start. Thank you. I'll, I'll try a little bit. Um, I think uh, I won't try to say what we agreed on and what we didn't agree on. I'll just uh, throw out a couple of ideas. Uh, one of the things that's clearly underway uh, is that we're living in a world where the technology is, is obviously changing things. Uh, it's producing qualitative change, which is changing the way diplomacy is done to some extent, uh, although the, the basics are there, which is the interaction of, between people. Uh, and it's changing the environment in which it, it happens. Uh, that's obviously from obvious from Tahrir Square in, in, in Cairo. It's obvious fr also from WikiLeaks, as a matter of fact. That there is a, a that the, the the climate, the environment is changing for diplomats very much. Um, second thing I'd I think I'd like point I'd like to make is not directly related to that, and that is with the with the um, changes which are underway in the world, the inadequacies of some of the existing institutions become only more apparent. But at the same time, it's important not to think that you can just do without these. Uh, you know, the UN, uh, uh, United Nations itself, the charter is basically the, the rule book for international relations. And the UN is also a kind of uh, central operating system for the rest of the world. You can have more restricted groupings, you can have more uh, innovative ideas that are empowered because the UN is there. You can imagine, and I, the third point I want to talk about is the G20, how uh, controversial the G20 would be as an exclusive, restrictive, self-interested group if there wasn't a United Nations in which, there, which could both influence the G20 and in which the G20 could import its, uh, its agreements uh, into the UN. Uh, the G20 represents, to my mind, uh, the best way of saving the international system. Uh, I think the jury is, is still out. I think it's been much more successful than it's being given credit for. It has gotten itself into, regrettably, the uh, mindset that it has to produce an outcome every time there's a meeting. Uh, we, get, we get a handful of leaders, 20 leaders together or so. Uh, for a very short period of time, and the media decide, uh, you know, w wants to report whether the meeting was a success for, or a failure. When you're dealing with extremely difficult issues, very far-reaching issues that, that take years to resolve, you know, the, the, the basic message is not that 
uh, the G20 is not succeeding, but that it's dealing with very difficult issues. And leaders themselves and the media would be wise not to set up uh, 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 false uh, tests by which uh, success is to be measured. This is a kind of mini-lateralism. The UN Security Council is a kind of mini-lateralism. The G20 is the same. To my mind, the, the most important innovation that probably could come forward is that the G20 began to look beyond economics. It's in economics, specifically finance, where the G20 has advanced the furthest. But we're in a world where it's not only the international that has to become national, national policies also have to have be, be carried out in the context of, of the international scene. That's particularly the case with monetary policy, with exchange rate policy, climate change policy, and maybe even nuclear weapons policies. Uh, so that these are, this, this is a direction I think that we need to be going uh, in this <coughs> Facebook era. And I think I would say that uh, when I look at those pictures up there, those handsome uh, people, mm -hmm. I would say that these are faces for the diplomacy era that we're entering. <laughs> Plus my boss up there. I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what that says or whether I should be prompted to comment on that. You're um, virtually there. I'm virtually, yes. I'm, You're virtually, virtually, I'm there. virtually him. Um, who knows? Um, so I was uh, going to pick up on a couple of points, but uh, to bring it back to if, if we, and because I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts about sort of very generally what you think uh, diplomacy in the Facebook age is. And when we started this morning, we talked a little bit about how we might define diplomacy or how we've defined it in the past and how we might define it in the future. And I actually, uh, I had gone back to um, some very classic texts of diplomacy. And one thing that I cited this morning is Harold Nicholson's sort of two definitions of diplomacy. And either you can take your pick in terms of what's most applicable to diplomacy in this sort of new 21st, potentially 22nd century uh, era. Uh, one of it was this idea of that diplomacy was a management of international relations between sovereign states by negotiation, and it focused on official ambassadors and envoys. Parakana, who's just written a, a book on how to run the world, would argue miles away from that, that in fact all of us in this room, um, because we have the tools of new technology and major corporations, and NGOs and a plethora of other individual actors are in fact also diplomats in their own way and should be free to use uh, that, that title or that moniker. Nicholson's other definition is that diplomacy is the ordered conduct of relations between one group of human beings and another group alien to themselves. So that might get more to this idea of a flexible understanding of, of what diplomacy is. Um, However, and that that and we were talking about this idea of transnational threats, and um, in terms of thinking about the reform of institutions that have, up until certainly the the beginning of the 21st century, driven international relations and the sort of negotiation environment across heavy wooden tables with middle-aged, usually white men, uh, to a certain extent, Born wearing red ties. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't just say that. Um, no, but how that has sort of, how that has moved on, and, and as, as Ambassador Heinbecker was already saying, there's now new locuses of, of discussion with players who haven't um, been there at the advent of shaping a Western value system that dictates the way, or has dictated the way, in which we think about global problems and what that might mean. So one thing that we also, you know, that we discussed and I think that we ultimately agreed upon is that this new technology, um, you know, that we've seen challenges um, or that we've seen new technologies arise that have made the conduct, the interpersonal, the people-to-people -people contact easier in the past, whether it was the advent of the telegraph or the advent uh, of, of, of rapid rail systems, and still that these became tools and didn't in fact displace or transplace the actual people-to-people -people contact. And what, um, what Tahrir Square is, is a wonderful example, but also um, the revolution uh, 1989 in my own country, Germany, um, we were just talking about that. Yes, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have Facebook, but they had Western television, and they knew that there was enough high stakes there that it was okay to gather in churches um, and to take protests out on the street. But it was not until the stakes were so high and that you could have an individual vested interest in it um, to, to come out and protest. Similarly, that you, you have that critical mass, 
So Facebook allows it, you know, allows us to click and like something at a very, very low risk. Um, you know, you can like cancer prevention or, you know, cute kittens. But that doesn't make you have to do anything, take action upon anything, shape in any way the environment in which you live in or the international environment. What happened in the streets of uh, across Leipzig and, and in Berlin and in Dresden and in East Germany in 1989 and in, in, in revolutions before that, 1981 in Poland and what have you. Um, and now, again, in Tahrir Square, ultimately still depends on people-to-people -people conduct um, and contact. And that brings me back to sort of this idea of what is a diplomat's role in the 21st century. And the um, Quadrennial Development and Diplomacy Review that was issued just a few months ago argues that part of the way that, um, and again, this is not, these are not tremendously new ideas. They have come up in the past. These are ideas that the State Department has developed in some ways in the past and previous administrations. This is the kind of thinking that's going on across the globe in, in State Departments, is this idea of, well, then, in managing all these complex interrelations, is perhaps that the job of the diplomat of the future? Is this idea of becoming a CEO um, of managing people that are, that are within his or her embassy, um, if you take the ambassador function, that discharge very specific functions that are experts in water engineering, that are experts in post-conflict resolution, that are that know aspects of rebuilding, that know aspects of civil society engagement? Do they have to be much more a CEO? Do they themselves have to be imbued with a different type of sovereignty and decision making to react flexibly and much more adaptably to sort of the, the very rapid changes that, that we're experiencing? So we ended up having, and, and, and I think we'll have this discussion here, a larger discussion about how do we prepare um, a new generation of uh, diplomats, if you will, that will still ultimately go through the traditional channel, uh, channels um, to deal with and to engage the kind of different interfaces that they will um, be put in front of to create a sort of more effective, more holistic um, sort of platform for action for international action. So um, we're, I think, very happy to have this discussion with all of you and uh, to take your questions. In terms of what we came up with and that, by, by no means uh, the conversation ends there. So. Uh, I'll be very interested to, to hear what you think. Okay. Uh, Professor Jones, over to you. Thanks. Just a couple of additional thoughts and some additional ideas to add to the mix in terms of what to do about it all. Uh, I start from the hypothesis that uh, actually quite traditional diplomacy with a quite traditional great power focus is still going to be centrally relevant to what we do in the next 5, 10, 20 years in managing international issues. Uh, especially with the rise of China and India and Brazil as major players in the international stage, that in some issue areas, that mode of great power traditional diplomacy is actually going to matter even more than it has in the past, of, say, 10 to 15 years during a period of largely American dominance in, in a whole set of issue areas. Uh, and then there are other issues, take climate change, where that kind of diplomacy is going to be gigantically dysfunctional. Uh, and when we see efforts to try in the Copenhagen process with intergovernmental summits, et cetera, it's nowhere near uh, coming to the point of actually achieving outcomes. And I think we can categorize this. If you look at the, the number of governments that are involved, that's one sort of metric you can use. Do we need five, ten, six governments to solve the problem, or do we need all 200? That's a very different kind of problem. But even more important to ask the question, is the issue area one where g central government power is the driving force of the issue? Or is it one where a whole set of governmental agencies or the public sector or the private sector, I mean, excuse me, or actually just citizen action itself is really the driving factor? So if you look at climate change, in order to produce real shifts in the consumption and production of energy, you're going to have to change the individual behavior of five or six billion people, right? Uh, is spread across 200 government countries. It's a fundamentally different kind of exercise than U.S.-Russia nuclear negotiations, which still matter a great deal, or U.S.-Chinese-Russia security negotiations in the South China Seas. So we may be doing quite different things in the diplomatic space, and in some of them, social networking and non-state actors and those kinds of uh, phenomena will feature very large, and in other of them, I think much more traditional diplomatic modes will feature still quite heavily. I actually think of it as really in sort of three sectors in a sense. One, great power security relations. 
to these widely distributed multilateral problems, global problems, climate change, biological security, et cetera. And then third, quite a different phenomenon in a way, is the business of responding to humanitarian crises or security crises in undergoverned or failed states or non-sovereign space or whatever terminology we want to use. All the terminology for that is fraught, but places where there's a kind of deep lack of governmental control over territory. And I'm skeptical up front. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're taking existing diplomatic institutions, existing military institutions, and existing national security management structures and believing that more or less unadapted, just sort of tweaked at the margins, we can simultaneously manage all three of those uh, problems. And I, I'm skeptical that we'll be able to, to do that. I think that probably deeper reforms are needed and that they're, in a sense, quite different. The business of managing diplomacy with China is fundamentally different than the business of being an American representative on the ground in Kandahar. These are fundamentally different things. Um, to put some ideas adding to the list on the table of the things we thought we would discuss might be useful to do, a number of them have already been mentioned. In the train of great power relations, there was an, uh, quite a lot of discussion about reform in the Security Council. I'm both an advocate and something of an optimist about the viability of that. There are a lot of people who are advocates but pessimists. I'm an advocate and an optimist on the viability of Security Council reform uh, and of bringing India, uh, probably Brazil, probably Japan, into a kind of much more sustained participation in the Security Council seems to me essential if we're going to handle great power relations in the coming period. On the second of these kind of broadly distributed multilateral problems, the main thing that I would look for as a kind of first step is completely changing the incentive structure for U.S. diplomacy so that people who serve in the highest reaches of U.S. diplomacy and the, the national security staff have to have participated, have to have served inside multilateral institutions or on multilateral negotiation processes. If you look at the senior reaches of the National Security Council right now and the senior reaches of the, United St of the State Department, you'd be surprised at how few people in those positions have ever served in a multilateral institution or even an overseas post. Uh, it's quite possible in the United States to develop a highly productive career bouncing back and forth between government jobs in Washington and think tanks and never serving in a foreign government and never working in a multilateral institution. I think we need to change that to get American diplomacy to understand the very different realities of complex multilateral diplomacy than the Washington policy game. Uh, and the third thing I would do is on the, the fragile states question is move away from what we've got right now, which are complex interagency or whole of government processes, to actually new tools, joint integrated operational services uh, to which people from different parts of governments and NGOs and others could be seconded, but that actually function as separate institutions, not just sort of adjuncts to existing foreign ministries or existing defense departments. I don't think we're going to get there through those kinds of approaches. But the big point in my <coughs> mind is, a completely new world of diplomacy, but some parts where traditional great power diplomacy still matter a great deal. And we need to have a differentiated sense of what's new and what's traditional and how to handle them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I should perhaps explain that um, Ambassador Nicholas Burns is actually, as we speak, <laughs> engaging in real life diplomacy. He had to go back to Harvard to talk to an ambassador. So we're Indian delighted. ambassador to the US, yes. <laughs> we also have two um, excellent additional resources here um, to field questions. Uh, Dr. J.P. Singh, uh, professor at Georgetown University, and Dr. Paul Sharp, professor at Duluth uh, in uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota. So uh, we will draw on them uh, in a flexible uh, manner according to the nature of the, the question. So uh, is there anybody who has a question initially? You can, as I say, State your name and where you're from. Yes, this lady. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joan Krimlis, and I'm a graduate of the School of Management here at BU. Um, and I, I just when you talked about multilateral institutions, I wondered uh, what it was you, uh, what you meant by that, and an example of what that is. Who is going to do one by one? Or? Uh, um, yes. Has anybody else got a question at the moment? Or should we take that one to start with? Well, there are all sorts of different types of multilateral institutions. I mean, the obvious big ones are the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, World Trade Organization, etc. cetera. Um, I think there are something like 100,000 officially registered international organizations out there. And some of them are very small and handle very small issue-specific areas. But the main things that I think we're talking about is if you look at climate change, if you look at infectious disease, if you look at nuclear issues, most of them are handled simultaneously through bilateral diplomacy and in international institutions where anywhere from 20 to 190 governments uh, participate with various degrees of power. Um, 
over the last 20 years, my take would be that the United States has put much less emphasis uh, on diplomacy within those kinds of arrangements than it has on direct bilateral diplomacy and the use of force. But the nature of shift in power in the international system means that it's much less able to accomplish that <laughs> and in many more instances forced into more complex negotiations with a much wider range of actors and it's got to develop the habits of serving in those complex negotiations. Uh, yes, any other questions? Yes, sir, thank you. Frederick Law, I'm uh, German Consul General to the area and I'd like, to, uh, well, first of all, to state that we are not only talking about diplomacy for the Facebook era, but uh, Facebook diplomacy, actually. Uh, I, I read some time ago that the State Department has two rather agile young diplomats who are in charge of, of the tweeting of the Twitter uh, branch uh, of the State Department. And uh, in, in the perimeter of my ministry, we're discussing uh, about uh, how to handle Facebook proactively. And I wonder whether you think that uh, diplomacy might become technically, uh, as to substance, even more difficult than it is right now uh, to conduct on a basis of mutual trust rather than with a view to the press and other uh, media, and uh, w uh, whether or whether Facebook diplomacy is not just another conduit, an another funnel, for the usual boring official statements. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, would you like to? I have no. never seen an official statement I considered boring. <laughs> <laughs> the quintessential Particu diplomat. Particularly you know. all those that I wrote. <laughs> 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 I used to be a speechwriter for a prime minister, so I have a lot on my conscience. <laughs> um, I think that I prefer to think in terms of the sort of advance of, t of the technology rather than just Facebook. I think Facebook is a facet of it. Uh, if you, in, in terms of the impact on diplomacy, arguably at least, the biggest impact <coughs> has been made by WikiLeaks. Uh, it, and it's only affected the diplomacy of one country, effectively. And, all, and some of that country's friends who get embarrassed by what's said or what they're quoted as having said but you're seeing ambassadors being removed and disappearing and uh, there's, there are consequences to that. So what, what will happen, I think, in that respect is that uh, certainly insofar as foreign ambassadors and dis diplomats are concerned, they're gonna be a lot more careful what they say to Americans from now on um, because you can end up being reported to Washington which can end up being on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, what's changed there though is not that people leak things. Of course, people have always leaked thing and there's always been spies. But the technology is, is such that you can leak the whole thing. Yeah, that you can leak you know, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 files. So everything can, can be leaked and, and that is going, that, that's a qualitative change. It's a quantitative change that makes a qualitative change. You don't, you know, you can't, you couldn't walk out of the building with 300,000 files. But you can do it now with a, you know, with a, with a, with a couple of CDs. So that's going to change a lot, I think. Uh, I don't think uh, that the nature. I don't think there's a substitute uh, for the people-to-people -people contact. If you're, I'm very struck by what uh, Bruce was saying about people in the senior levels of the, of the U.S. government, if that, if that is the case, who haven't served abroad, who haven't got that kind of international experience. Because that's how you understand the world. Uh, it, I guess it's been the case that if you understood the Beltway, mm -hmm. that was enough. In fact, that was, uh, that was all there was to understand. But in an era where there's going to be multiple power centers, you know, Beijing, China, India, Brazil, Russia, still the EU, um, that's tailor-made for diplomacy. That's, people need to understand what the interactions are. And, you, and it also brings a degree of humility to the policy-making process because you understand from having been abroad in this, I th what I would say the foreign ministries bring to, the, to policymakers is a kind of accumulated worldliness uh, over time and, and over distance that, that the leaders themselves lack. And, in, and until you, unless you really understand what you're doing, you can make a lot of mistakes. Things would seem to make perfect sense. Uh, 
in, uh, in, in your own context uh, make no sense at all when seen in a larger context. I think that uh, one of the great difficulties that governments are, are beginning to have is that the diplomacy is being carried by the heads of state and the heads of government more than, or the, or the foreign policy is. The, the embodiment of, the, of, the, of that particular state is the leader because there are so many summits that happen over and over and over and over again. We've gone back to the, you know, we've gone back and we've gone forward to the past. Now it's the, the president and the prime minister again who carry foreign policy. That was the case a hundred years ago in a lot of countries. It's now again the case. The problem is that if you look at the, at the White House, the National Security Council, you look at most foreign governments, the capacity of, the, of those foreign ministries with their accumulated wisdom and, and worldliness to actually provide advice to the person who's carrying the file is very limited. You know, they're, they're sort of stuck off doing the technical, the technical things and the policy sophistication is having to be developed by a very small number of people very, almost always very bright, but not necessarily very experienced or worldly, and all under enormous pressure. And so they're going to make and 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 they're going to make mistakes. One of the things that has to be corrected in the in the Facebook generation or any in the current technology era is we have to find some way of bringing foreign ministries back together with the people who are actually carrying the foreign policy briefs. Mm -hmm. Um, Catherine, did you yeah, want to I was uh, just going to pick up on that. So that one of those people is Alec Ross, um, who is uh, not quite forty years old. Um, he he is has three hundred thousand followers on uh, Twitter, um, which I'm told are called tweets. This is uh, funny because I'm younger than he is, but these are the things that I am now too learning. Um, the very power of what Alec does um, and and what. Um, the State Department has thought about doing is this idea of creating a virtual interface of actual interaction, right? So it's not about trying to condense the traditional briefing into 140 characters and putting that out and just sort of as passive information, but to use it as a tool of engagement. Now, does that tool of engagement mean that you know you use those same tools or you can use those same tools to manipulate foreign policy elsewhere, right? That you can ask as a government, a private enterprise like Twitter to delay their um, you know their systems overhaul so that and this is a question if you really believe that that was the case, that you know, the Iranian pro-revolutionists could keep tweeting, although then you know, the point has come up that if it was really Iranian revolutionists, then why were they all sort of tweeting in English um, and not in Farsi? Um, then, th I mean, that sets up a very, it sets up a very different interface. You're putting yourself, and we talked a lot about um, this idea of accountability and how do you, you know, is there, is there a space for um, holding uh, diplomatic decisions, if you will, or foreign policy decisions accountable? Well, if you start opening yourself up to um, at least an interaction, whether you act on that interaction or not, at least you begin to have a, a, a dialogue and you have a better idea. And so Alec Ross actually spends quite a bit of time, if you look at his uh, Twitter feed, the interaction that he's having is he's communicating with different people who are commenting on piece of policy X, um, you know, he will, he mixes, and again, you, you can wonder if this is the right way to do it. He mixes part of his political life and part of his sort of own interactions with sort of his personal observations. And he's managed to get the, the, the Secretary of State to allow him that freedom. What is the impact of that? Well, at the very least, that people seem to, and again, the question is, what is, is it a question of depth in terms of interest and interaction? Um, but people seem to be reading this. Um, so does that, you know, so is that more than a facet, a different facet of public diplomacy? Probably, probably not until we see, until we can make a real causal linkage that, you know, Egypt can be blamed solely on U.S. technology that emanated from a, a company in Silicon Valley. And even behind that, there are sort of 50,000 questions about cultural imperialism and who owns technology and how does technology, you know, how can technology get used by the state? Can it be co-opted in that way if it's developed and owned by a private company? And what impact does that have on state-to-state -state relations when other powers uh, don't necessarily have that technology, need to buy it, et cetera, et cetera. And 
Um, so there's sort of those dimensions behind it. But on a very basic level, does it open what can essentially seem as a monolithic, faraway structure of decision making to at least some sh form of interaction? Yes. Is it enough to truly change the shape of the world, as other people have, have argued? Not unless you're furthering other things. So, you know, Clay Shirky and other people have argued that what the United States government, for instance, needs to do is not just push for anti-censorship, not this idea of not just um, uh, pushing the Chinese government not to continually on a regular basis shut down Google or Facebook or take things off the internet that they don't seem fit, but then to continue to push uh, on the creation of open spaces of public interaction in the widest sense. Um, so that your, your arsenal of public diplomacy becomes much richer. Uh, because I'm you know, just reminded again that the listeners of, of, of uh, Voice of America did not dismantle the Berlin Wall. Germans did, right? So there's, there's got to be, there's more, there's got to be more behind that. There's one uh, irony that I don't know if, if it's uh, striking other people as ironic. Uh, and that is we're talking about the impact of, uh, of the modern technology, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, basically on foreign policy. But all that you've heard so far is how governments are using that technology to influence, with the exception of WikiLeaks, to in influence other people in public diplomacy. So we're in, a, we're, we're in a position where we're talking about the great revolution that's happening and everybody is participating. But what we're really doing is saying, you know, is targeting all those people with the information we want them to have. We're skeptics. <laughs> we, we want, you know, this is, this is, this is where we need the, the input from the floor. It's just, just to add one thing, I think Alec Ross has, has called social networking the Che Guevara of the 21st century. I mean, you don't always know the effects of a Che Guevara thrown <coughs> into the international scene, but uh, as, as Paul and Catherine have said, it is a challenge to governments to use obvious opportunities, and nobody has quite worked it out. I think it's it's one of the reasons we convened the, the meeting today. Uh, could, could we take then these three together? I think we have three upcoming questions, so then we'll, um, we'll note them. I was, does it work? Maybe okay, I, um, I, I'm from, the first 21 years were in India, born in North India, grew up in South India. And the next 14 years, 1960 to 74, were in Pakistan. Yeah. And 80 to 86, I was back in Pakistan. I would like to, you know, touch on something which is not within the diplomatic circle or, you know, within academia or within, you know, I would like to talk of something from the outside. Uh, diplomacy, I assume you, I don't know if you agree with it, but diplomacy is furthering the foreign policy of a nation, diplomats do. This is, I take it, I don't know, I may be wrong. If an embassy or diplomats, you know, if that is not one of their functions, then, you know, I, I will stand corrected. But, and even if people like, I mean, even if countries like India win to this, you know, a place in the Security Council, basically any profession becomes, you know, the insider's club. And if India joins the Security Council, it very much wants so, then it's the power I have seen diplomacy basically as an exercise in power from Pakistan. The exercise of the power elites in Pakistan being hand in league with the diplomats of America to further their own interests. Diplomacy, uh, in 86 I was reading the, uh, the, the old thesis, the previous thesis of the 70s of the Sloan School. And New York Times at one point never hired a person from a foreign country at one time as a correspondent, never. Not a single correspondent uh, until 70 something. And it explained that, yeah. so in America, you get, the f you, you get the picture of diplomacy from what the newspapers report, unless you know a diplomat in person. And to me, from Pakistan at least, the, the, you know, it is very bitter, you know, the hand, the, 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 the we, we have not touched on the covert diplomacy. We've touched as, as if diplomacy is neutral, as if diplomacy is benign. The intelligence agencies within the embassies have not been touched upon. Did you the have, have a question, agency. sir? The question is this, you know. It is 
I'm hoping that the Facebook era will loosen up what for the outsiders would be seen as an inside club. And I'm hoping okay. that you know, WikiLeaks was just a, uh, just an yeah. edge into what is sometimes very cruel and not benign at all. I mean, we've never heard of what happened in Indonesia where millions were killed with the CIA help. Nobody ever talks about it in the USA. Mm -hmm. And Suakarna was overthrown to bring Suharto. And that was part of the US intelligence services, part of the diplomats. I have yet to see a single story in the US media ever of Indonesia. Okay, thank you. We'll ask our panel to address. Could we have the, the second one? And uh, let's make it. Uh, Chris, yes, you. Uh, I'm also the student of professor here, and uh, I just want to ask uh, about one or two questions about um, public di diplomacy section. As you commented, uh, public, uh, public the development of public diplomacy is now uh, take a like higher stage. Um, uh, so, uh, how do we? I think the status quo of the diplomacy in uh, the non-governmental sector, like uh, pri uh, private sector uh, or city, uh, uh, diplomacy in this uh, between citizens of two countries, uh, and uh, that's that's the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Jeremy Weiss. I'm a PhD student here in uh, the political science department. Um, if you want to talk about you know, getting away from the government using the internet to get the message out. Uh, that's one of the, <coughs> that's one of the things I wanted to ask. Um, as representatives of government, don't you feel maybe, and this is sort of a double-edged, double-ended question, that the internet is, is causing people inside the state apparatus to just lose control of the narrative, um, sort of like what you were just talking about? Because in the old days of traditional media, you could you know, read an article, and there would be some points by the journalists, then a quote from the foreign ministry, and that would kind of be it. But now on the internet, there are so many sources that have so many loyal followers that, y you know, you as representatives of the state can never, ever hope to reach or impress or control them all. So, number one, don't you think maybe that's causing you to lose control of the narrative? Um, and secondly, back to a point that you made earlier, um, I sort of get the feeling that the internet is a little bit of a trap. Um, because you, s you mentioned earlier, you know, that the Berlin Wall wasn't brought down by Facebook. It was brought down by people on the streets, you know, ordinary Germans. Uh, but now the risk is less, that you don't have to go out in the street. You can click the like button <coughs> and feel like you've done something. Um, but I feel that a lot of people are skeptical of that because nowadays you can click the like button, you feel like you've done something, and that's the end. So other people, th you know, some people are saying it's causing states to lose control of the narrative. Other people are saying that the Internet is great because it's a giant sinkhole where everybody can feel good by doing really nothing and not threaten the status quo. So what do you feel about that mm -hmm. dichotomy? Very good, thank you. Well, Ambassador Heinbecker has actually, of course, sat on the UN Security Council as the ambassador of Canada. So perhaps you could address this, this India-Pakistan uh, question as, as to... Um, I guess uh, I'm, of, I'm of two minds about it. Um, if I were sitting in, in Bahrain, I would want to have as much access to as much information about what was going on in my government as possible. If I'm sitting in Canada, uh, I have a different attitude towards it. You know, I have an elected government more or less responsible, more or less effective, that is acting on my behalf. And, and my uh, interest is in, in, in their continuing to do that. And I recognize as a, as a you know, a citizen, that there are things that they have, they have to do which are uh, secret. Uh, you know, if I'm negotiating a mortgage with a bank, uh, I don't tell them what my bottom line is and then ask them how much they're going to charge. Uh, in, in a lot of other cases, there, you know, there is a need for some sort of uh, capacity. If, if you're in a trade negotiation, you know, you don't lay out what your, ba what your bottom line is until you sort of you, you negotiate to, to get to whatever is agreeable. So there is some need for security, and what I think is going to happen, what, I, what I'm near certain is going to happen, is that there's going to be more secrecy, not less secrecy. Uh, diplomats will find ways of communicating, and they won't be writing it down. Uh, they won't be certainly uh, letting it get leaked. Uh, 
there will be more and more compartmentalization of information. The United States will face a situation that, you know, the, the, the thing that caused WikiLeaks effectively was 9-11 in the sense that, uh, you know, they needed to be making people talk to each other connected so they could connect the dots. But it meant that more people had access to a lot more information. So, it, and by the way, you haven't seen any secret uh, cables yet. So, and, and those are those are compartmentalized, and there's a lot of other compartmentalization that can take place. So, the information is just not going to is not going to be available. I fear that it's probably going to turn out to be less information in the end than more information. And I think the second part I, point I'd make about that is that so far you're only getting information about the United States. Now the United States is obviously the most important country, but you know, uh, if, China, if China were, uh, its, its secrets were, were being revealed, if Russia's secrets were being revealed, if everybody else's secrets were being revealed, uh, I think it could be a pretty turbulent outcome. So uh, I'm, I'm a little, put me down as, as a little bit uh, skeptical. I would make a distinction, although you didn't make it, I'd make a distinction between covert and overt uh, activities. I don't, um, uh, the, the business of diplomats is to, under, you know, I used to say we're one part, uh, one part analyst, one part uh, uh, salon keeper, one part saloon keeper, one part flagpole. Uh, we, have a lot, we have a lot of, uh, of, of functions, but, uh, but fundamental to it is gathering information. Uh, but it's gathering information in, in at least the way that is internationally sanctioned. Uh, everybody is accepted that a job of a diplomat is to try to go, go to the country he's going to and understand what's going on and try to understand it, what the impact of what that is on his own interests. I don't, uh, the, the covert activities uh, are activities that are carried out that are, that are, that are not widely accepted as, as being, uh, they're, they're widely practiced, but not widely condoned. Uh, and uh, I, c I can say less about that, partly because Canada doesn't have an offensive uh, intelligence service. We have, a, we, have some, we have some defensive capability, but we have no offensive intelligence service. So, I, whether what is, what's going on under the guise of diplomacy is benign or not, uh, and, and how that plays out between India and Pakistan, um, that's uh, very difficult to, to, to discuss in the, in the abstract. If there are, you know, when there are particular cases, you can sort of make some kind of judgment about whether something that was done was sensible or not sensible or dangerous or not dangerous or downright nefarious. But you can't very easily do it sort of in general terms. Diplomacy is the interaction of, uh, of states, in effect. Uh, we talked a lot about the interaction of people, but I don't really, cons I consider that diplomacy, but maybe with, a, with, with in quotation marks. It's not the same thing. It's not the implementation of a foreign policy, because the second thing that diplomats do is they advocate. They advocate at home to change the policy, and they advocate on the ground to try to persuade people. That's what your job is, to persuade people you know, to proceed in a way which is not inimical to the interests of, of your own country. Since 1950s, Western Wayne, uh, mm. the, the embassy is in Islamabad, in, the embassy in Islamabad and the consulate in Karachi, um, uh, um, I understand that the, one of the highest percentage of CIA agents within the diplomatic corps is in Pakistan. Since 1950, not mm. after September 11 or something. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, you know, I mean, it's, they have, co a huge part of the diplomatic core. Well, I don't know a huge part. 20, 30 percent is covert. So, you know, it's, it's, it has a very <coughs> large impact on Pakistan. Mm. Mm. I just add one point. I think, I mean, the WikiLeaks cables obviously were embarrassing uh, to individuals, but they were reporting, obviously, the, be the best information they had. They didn't want to be banal. They wanted to give. And it also actually uh, suggested that in a lot of big issues like North Korea, Iran, mm. what the U.S. had been saying in public about the interests of other countries and their fears and mm. concerns w was actually true because it was based on uh, direct conversations, obviously expected to be confidential, but with um, with diplomatic representatives of of, I of interested countries. Um, perhaps we can move on to the second question. I wonder whether Bruce, uh, you might be interested. This is, I think, uh, 
the challenge to government public diplomacy of what NGOs do or is the private sector getting its message out more than more effectively now than governments? Yeah, in a sense, the second and third questions were, were closely related. It was sort of who controls the narrative and, and, and does it matter? Um, I, I, my own sense of this is that what happens in the space of interaction between civil society organizations and civil society organizations, or private sector to private sector or in that mix, is largely happening in a benign sense uh, in that it largely happens between countries where we're in, in a situation of deeply embedded relations of trade and social interaction of all sorts of types, right? I mean, there's going to be a, an awful lot more civil society to civil society messaging and interaction between the United States and Germany uh, than between the United States and China right now. We're going to have a different kind of relationship with Germany, right? Now, you also have, for example, civil society interaction between the United States and Egypt for sort of democracy promotion purposes, et cetera, which wasn't at the behest of the government. And it's sort of one of the interesting things. People are now sort of worrying about, well, gosh, we didn't have very good early warning about the fact that there was going to be an uprising <coughs> in, in Egypt. I comment on the idiocy of that statement from a whole host of perspectives. But one of them is, if we had it, what would we have done? Uh, were we going to crush the uprising somehow? Through what tool? Encourage them somehow? Through what tool? It's nonsensical. So in my mind, a lot of what happens in that space and gets comment is in the, in the terrain of the benign. Um, the question about whether governments control the narrative, whether the internet sort of diffuses the narrative, I think the governments are playing catch up on this, right? Um, some of what happens in the sphere of blogosphere and lots of comment on policy positions is so bizarre and random that I don't think it has a huge impact on the narrative. And then there are very focused, very targeted, sort of high quality blogs or high quality sort of uh, social entrepreneurs in the media space that sort of do try to shift the narrative. And governments are really playing catch up there. Uh, and multilateral institutions even more so. I used to tease the UN spokesperson that you know, if you want somebody who can write a letter to the editor of the International Herald Tribune, uh, wow, the UN spokesperson is fantastic for that. At which point maybe you have a chance of, what, convincing the 10 readers who are going to read it who are already totally committed by virtue of having bought the International Herald Tribune, right? Whereas if you're trying to influence the, the you know, Al Jazeera watchers or Fox News watchers, the UN is nowhere. The United States government is beginning to catch up to that. It's getting better at some of that uh, and recognizing that internet and, and TV uh, really does shape the narrative. I actually think on Paul point, Paul's point here is really right. TV still much, much more than internet. In the Arab uh, awakening, Al Jazeera profoundly more powerful than the, the Twitter and Facebook issues. Twitter and Facebook were important for the tactics of how to get to Tahrir Square mobilizing, but the shaping of the concepts, the shaping of the movement, the shaping of the uh, sense of opportunity was Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. which, let's not forget, is a government-owned tool. Uh, and when there was a deal struck, which there was last week over Bahrain, Al Jazeera basically shut off coverage of the Shia uprising against the Sunni kingdom in Bahrain. Shut it off. You can't find the Bahrain crisis on Al Jazeera now, um, more or less. So we confuse categories sometimes, but television is still very powerful. But television, in, in that universe at least, is not, a, is not a private or a social tool. It's a tool of government. Catherine, do you want to address Well, I'm, I'm just going to say two things. I mean, uh, just to Bruce's last point, because it made me chuckle um, when I think about uh, how the European Commission um, used to run its communication through bureaucrats, and only literally four years ago did they have a competition for journalists and communications people and press people, because then they suddenly figured out that maybe the best way to tell the story is not actually by using people who are bureaucrats and not trained or who don't really know how to tell a compelling story and a compelling narrative, right? And then you think about how long the European Union has been in existence and then all you want to do is shake your head and cry. Um, <clears throat> but that's, that's, that's an aside in a way. I mean, I don't think that there's anything and every government has always had to contend with the fact that there's going to be different messages and critical messages about what it does. I mean, in, in a Western democratic system, that, you know, that's the fourth power in the state. It, it controls and it, and it has that function of accountability. So per se, there's, there's nothing really wrong with that. I think the bigger problem is this kind of idea that there's been a number of sort of papers about um, in the last couple 
weeks and months is sort of say say do gap, right? So if we're you know um, trying to think about how we re-engage the, the the Taliban and how we actually get the reconciliation process off the ground and which parties and which regional players we bring to the table, and then how we sort of really ultimately um, find a way of, of you know we just had the attack again in the in the green zone of of getting ourselves out of Iraq in a sustainable way, um, and then you you know then things emerge from the kill squad and, the, and those pictures travel the world and um, you know the sort of things that I think America in that case um, taken you know given its 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 military prowess across the world that's a real problem, right? This idea that you're still trying to push soft power and you're trying to really push on your values and then every once in a you know, cu couple years you have um, these, horrendous, these horrendous stories or you have you know, the kind of confusion that's arisen now uh, about, the, about the case of the CIA operative in Pakistan. I mean, what does this, what does this say about what uh, ultimately the values of US foreign policy is, right? If you have Th th those kind of incidences and uh, incidents and, and how do you deal with them, right? And how does that, dis I think that's much more in a way disruptive to the narrative and much more disruptive to this idea of soft power because the idea of soft power is that you're using every tool in the book to not coerce but to convince the rest of the international system that yours is the right way, the right set of values, the, you know, the, the Western beacon of light, whatever you want to call it, and however, you know, what flowery terms you might want to use. But if you're con consistently under undermining yourselves by going against those in some way, then that say-do gap, right, is going, to, is going to be so fundamental that th there's no way that, you know, you can't window dress that enough to, to make that work and sell that to, 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 different, to different groups. Yeah, yes, any other questions? Uh, can we take the one behind Chris first? Thank you. I'm uh, Simon Winslow, I'm a sophomore at CIS. Um, the other day I discovered that the US State Department has a French-only Twitter account, um, which is directed towards the, the French media. And, um, I was wondering, and obviously other countries could do this just as easily towards American citizens. So I was wondering, as uh, Twitter has a great equalizing potential of a famous celebrity and myself have equal voice on Twitter. Would you think uh, that the state, the United States State Department, and the French, German, uh, Japanese Foreign Service could have an equal voice in influencing each other's citizens and kind of going around the uh, official government narratives thereof? Mm -hmm. Governments have been doing public diplomacy and trying to influence uh, the, the publics of other countries for a long time. I hate to break the news, but we've been trying to do that in Washington since time began. And we've been trying to influence the U.S. Congress, and the way to influence the U.S. Congress is by influencing the U.S. public. Uh, it, it doesn't work very well, I would have to say, but it, isn't, it hasn't stopped us uh, from, from dealing with it. On a related question, on the question of, um, of you know, uh, your, your, val your value as, is equal to the value of, uh, uh, of, a, di of a dignitary, well, of a celebrity, you said. Uh, the dip, um, so democratically, that's certainly true, uh, and maybe even substantively, it's true. But I doubt it's true if that I would give the same credibility to uh, 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 a blogger as I'm giving to Paul Krugman in the in the New York Times. Even WikiLeaks felt the need to distribute the information it had through somebody who could interpret it. You know, it went to the five or six newspapers, and, and they decided what was go going to be carried and when it was going to be carried. Uh, and and what they were going to and what they were going to say about it because you know, and I, and one of the reasons I think it's dangerous. Uh, take the government in North Korea, a lot of information was revealed about the government about the operations of you know what the United States thought of North Korea and what other people told the United States they thought about North Korea, and then say to yourself now this is possibly a nuclear armed country, that has twice attacked uh, militarily you know, uh, both the island and the ship. It's run by people who are at least, uh, you know, uh, the nicest way I, could, I guess I could put it is not completely sound. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time to read all that stuff on North Korea, but I'm pretty sure that the North Koreans are reading it all. And who knows what kind of conclusions they're drawing from that. Uh, a, a case also in Pakistan where there was a discussion about uh, nuclear material being stored in a, in, a, in, a, in a reactor that the Americans were trying to persuade the 
Pakistanis to, to sort of liberate so that it could be put in a safer place. Well, that story is out that they failed in their attempts at that persuasion. So now everybody knows where that stuff is. And whether, and whether that makes us all safer because we now know, or whether it makes us unsafer because some people who know who may be able to act on that information in a way that's prejudicial to our interests. You know, I, that's what I'm worrying about in this, uh, you know, the, the I, I guess it depends on where you sit. If you're from a democratic country, you're, you're, in li you're likely to have greater faith in the institutions of government. If you're, if you're coming from a country where, they, where you're pretty sure they're lying to you all of the time, uh, then you might have less. Yeah. Can I just to add on this? I used to serve in the Middle East. I was part of the UN's negotiating team in the Middle East peace process. And if you want to experience a country whose political system is 100% penetrated by leaks and social media, et cetera, Israel. Okay? You go to a cabinet meeting in Israel, there's a cabinet discussion, and within five minutes at the end of the cabinet meeting, literally, every member of the cabinet is leaking to the press and on Twitter and et cetera. Right? And you get 15 different accounts of what was decided in cabinet. This goes to the point you made before. The consequence of it is cabinet is irrelevant to decision making. All decision making in Israel happens very closely around the prime minister with national security advisor, top defense officials, the foreign minister has nothing to do with it, the diplomatic service has nothing to do with it, uh, and there's very little democratic accountability for what happens around the decision making, and which is all secret. Uh, and most of what happens in the negotiations with the Palestinians and these kinds of things does not leak. Most of it is secret, uh, much, much more so than in the past because of this phenomenon of uh, the kind of everybody's equal and the kind of sharing of information. All that happens is that real decision moves out of those spaces into it continues to find private spaces. So you're in a, in a catch up game, right? The technologies seek to penetrate decision making. They do, decision making moves on. Uh, and we've seen the same thing in the Security Council. We see the same thing everywhere. It's a kind of constant process like that, I think. Cabinets of, of, go of governments, uh, democratic governments, have become focus groups. Uh, where the leader tries out an idea to see what kind of reaction it gets, and if it gets a positive reaction, he might very well go ahead and do that. But the idea that this was, this was a group of, of equals, and the prime minister is a primus inter pares, and they decide collectively on what they're doing, that doesn't happen anymore. Do, I mean, do we foresee a time when social networking, including Twitter, will become a serious sort of fashion tool of diplomacy? I don't know whether JP... You wanted to say something on that, or Catherine? I mean, is it is it going to remain a, a very sort of tabloid type exercise, or can it be made more sophisticated to actually have an impact? I mean, we've talked of global citizenry. I mean, can it really be a force in international affairs so governments can harness um, what goes on in in the network, the blogosphere, in in a positive way, or is it going to remain? instantaneous, superficial, maybe attractive for five seconds and then... Well, I'll just, I'll just pick up on that, on that last point, actually, because it gets to this idea of multilingual. So when, when we had Alec Ross, uh, so I should say I'm the executive director of a, of a program on, on the future of diplomacy uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. And when we had Alec Ross in um, to talk to sort of about where are we all going with this, this modern tech, quote unquote, within the State Department, um, part of what you know, part of what drove the State Department to embrace this technology with such fervor was this idea that you know uh, the the Taliban and 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 Al Qaeda had been using you know modern technology for a long time and didn't need to be anywhere, right? This idea of of remote vo motivation of, of 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 martyrdom and you know uh, recruiting people to specific training camps um, from uh, Hamburg and elsewhere. Um, would work through the internet without any, you know, without any of the sort of things that Paul and I have been talking about, the importance of people to people. People, you know, that, yet that got people there. So there was enough motivation there. So in fact, that was a very fundamental national security concern. And so what's behind that is this idea of, um, you know, understanding, unpacking, and I think this is sort of the subtext of, of what Alec was getting at, the linguistic dimension too, right? So this is really gets in some ways at the nexus between 
classical diplomacy, like you, using the people in, on the ground and the understanding of what sort of drives and sets an agenda in the country on the ground, and then turning it around and using it um, in, in, in the language that you know, people are speaking. Um, and in a way that it's it's going to to be attractive to them, but 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 more you know, but more so than a veneer, right? Because if part of the exercise of that that um, State Departments and home offices and whatever you're calling your foreign ministry around the world are going for, um, instead of just window dressing and public diplomacy and sort of um, you know this kind of this small interaction is the prevention of the spread of uh, radicalization and of of of, of potentially. Uh, you know, global terrorism in the widest possible definition, then you're going to have to get at a couple of different layers there and a linguistic dimension and a better cultural understanding and a, you know, a, and a better understanding of nuance and, a, you know, a <laughs> listening closer is going to be much more important than just output, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, there's, a, there's a couple of additional dimensions there that, you know, um, I know that in the German foreign ministry and in the French foreign ministry, they're thinking very much about how, how do we do this now? And a lot of it will have to be, or, or the potential comparative advantage to what the U.S. is doing, although it's, you know, sort of uh, in the technology world or in the technological sense, so many steps ahead of um, other established Western, and my consul general is uh, smiling in the back, um, um, of so other far. West, so far, so far, that's what I'm saying. So what I'm getting at is I'm, 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 I'm going to speak for, for uh, my own country of origin. Um, no, but I think there might be a bit of a comparative advantage for, for countries that have, you know, that are, that in some ways have been in the past more, um, more at least attuned to um, these sort of multilingual, multinational environments, if, if, if at all. Um, yes, please you. I'm a senior in our IR department here at Boston University. And I'm just curious that as the four of you sit here and comment on the impact or lack of impact of Facebook and Twitter, how many of the four of you have either of those accounts and how, how do you use them? Um, because <laughs> I think that's, that's a huge point here, especially if you're going to talk about Tashir and things like that. Because uh, especially you made a comment, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name, but you made a comment about uh, Iran, the Iranians tweeting in English instead of Farsi. And I think that a lot of the point of that, uh, and especially if, even if you look at like the Egypt threads and um, the, the Libyan threads and that sort of thing, they're tweeting in English because it's a, it's, that's the audience they're seeking. They're not using it to coordinate their own internal rev revolutions. They're using it as a, pub a, as a source of uh, giving information to people who are of their age and are in the same kind of uh, they would have the same sort of political power as they do. So just kind of um, what you think maybe a little bit uh, was the, p the role of Twitter outside of the actual revolution, but in, pub in publicizing the revolution, and then a bit on your own personal social media uses, just out of mm -hmm. curiosity. Anybody got personal social uh, media? I Facebook, <laughs> I don't do Twitter, although Brookings, where I work, does both. I have to <coughs> confess that my sort of my gut attitude towards Twitter, John Stewart once said that he was going to create a website, call, uh, uh, a social media tool called Fritter, <laughs> where what you would do is you would post short blogs about what you would be doing if you weren't wasting your time on Twitter. And I'm sort of, <laughs> I'm sort of sympathetic to that, to that mindset, I confess. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with your point that, you know, so this is what they were trying to figure out about the Iranian revolution, right? Was it the Iranian diaspora that was retweeting things that they were hearing and that, you know, has, has to a large uh, extent happened or, or been true? And I do think that's exactly the case, right? You're, and because, and, and that you're, you've made the perfect argument that, that some of the, some of the media professional or some of the, some of the, um, Academics looking exactly at whether or not Twitter will, you know, sort of create the next revolutionary uh, movement, or whether it's really at the heart of that. It's, it's that people are not using that to, you know, that's where cell phones, in fact, are much more, um, you know, and 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 in fact, that's what the State Department and, and in terms of USAID is actually pushing in Africa because it's not about internet connectivity, it's everybody has a cell phone, right? And this is true, I worked, uh, I consulted uh, to the uh, mayor of New York, and I worked on uh, the limited English proficiency population there, and part of my strategy in terms of pushing out um, this was essential documentation for this community in New York, pushing out that information that we now had created this website that would allow you to apply for a birth certificate in Arabic, 
um, was over cell phones because I spent a lot of time looking at migrant communication behavior within New York City. And you'll find within different groups of migrants, very, you know, vastly different Russian migrants in New York City uh, are elderly. They have, they don't, they don't even have the cell phones. And that's all people to people. So if I want to communicate to them as the city, as the state, as a country, whatever, you have to find the avenue of communication that works for them. So you're absolutely right. Um, that was a 2A that was geared to the outside in terms of everything that we can tell now. Um, I have a Facebook tw page. Um, I use it a lot to let people know uh, what I'm reading and what I think about. Now I do use it a lot to advertise my own events and the things that I do. So in <laughs> fact, my 894 friends are extremely, exceptionally informed about what the Future Diplomacy Project does. Um, which is very helpful. Um, I and am, they're and they're reading it. Right? Oh, always. <laughs> Would you think they're liking it like crazy? <laughs> you know, right? So many clicks, unbelievable. Um, no, but the point of it, it's a, it's a good question because I mean, we, um, I have a, I have a very active student advisory board. Part of the reason I have this student advisory board. Uh, over at the at Harvard Kennedy School, there's 30 people on it, is in some ways to keep me honest, to keep me connected to what students care about and what they want to um, be hearing and seeing. And so we've actually been having this debate among, uh, among a group whether, you know, whether a Twitter account is actually, I'm kind of in, in Bruce's uh, camp because I kind of think nothing that I do is honestly worth 140 characters that I have exactly. to, you know, <laughs> sort of push that out at every three seconds. I mean, you know, I, it's kind of like with, with my, my various academic theses. You know, I don't think anybody but my father would possibly read that and find that interesting, okay? <laughs> and I mean, the same was true for my 180-page undergraduate thesis, you know, and it's sort of that same. Nobody else read that either except for my dad. So I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't get that unless you're doing it almost from an institutional vantage point. You consistently have something new to share and interact with with someone. Uh, Facebook is a little different, but you know I've had that for a while. So maybe it's just a fact of mm -hmm. I'm not accustomed to it, and I'm of the generation that's increasingly resistant to change. Right? It just means I was born in the 70s. <laughs> just one sort of a quick factoid: uh, in Africa, in the past decade, has been just to reinforce this, gone from two million cell phone owners to 450 million cell phones in use in Africa. So. Mm -hmm. look to the next wave of social change through that. Anyone else like to confess? Uh, yeah. JP? <laughs> or no, do you have Facebook? That wasn't what I was going to I'm just horrified that you have more friends than I do. Ah. <laughs> 60 more. Oh. Well, I've Unless I've been deep. I've got to keep that up. I, 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 I will, could have sworn you weren't on Facebook. <laughs> I, I will add to that that my boss, the former US uh, Undersecretary for Political Affairs, has none of those things and looks at me wide-eyed and often sends me memos in word perfect. So, do you feel like there's an internet savviness that should also accompany like the international savviness that you spoke of when you were talking about the State Department? Yeah, I mean, it's a technological savviness, right? And it sort of it'll it'll fluctuate what that is. I mean, I think sitting here, we can't. I, I doubt we predict what five years from now the most important social networking tool is. Maybe it'll be Facebook. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll be sales. Maybe it won't. Who knows? Uh, the it's a challenge it. of. Well, you've got a Blackberry. Black he's, 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 he's bought and paid for it. That's his own For some strange deal For some reason, uh, I, I keep referring to my Blackberry. <laughs> for some it, reason. it could be because the people it, who make like Blackberry uh, act, fund our institution. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, so but, but if you want to have connectivity with both cell phone and text, of course, you can use your BlackBerry. <laughs> Unfortunately, a large, large part of the world <laughs> can't afford it. Um, I, I'll just add a, a confession. I'm actually not on Facebook, but we're, my wife and I have six kids, and they all are. And my wife is, so most of my time is spent following what they do on Facebook. Uh, one of my sons kindly created a Facebook site for a, a novel I wrote, so I, I guess I'm sort of with one foot in there. But apart from that, uh, not really. Um, Paul, did you? Uh, no. no? I decide don't use it. <laughs> um, okay. Can I just, on that subject, and uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm sorry, I've, I should have announced this at the beginning. This event is actually being live tweeted. Right, so well. uh, we are capturing what we you're saying. Yeah, I'll contribute to that. That's what Fritter I'm aware. on. Yeah. And so for those of you who are addicted and would like to read and listen at the same time, well, <laughs> you could, can. Could uh, I, thank you very much. Could, could I just take a quick check? Uh, how many more questions do we have? Um, 
So perhaps could we take those all together? With four, is that? Yeah. So could you perhaps bring the microphone here at the front? We'll take. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion about um, basically using the internet for diplomacy, for like promoting soft power and such, but um, promoting democracy and so on. But one thing I've noticed is that um, perhaps a large percent of the population that could most benefit from this either are so impoverished that they wouldn't have access to the internet, or they live in countries where the uh, government actually restricts their access to the internet. So um, basically, how do you deal with this discrepancy between your targeted audience and um, basically how do you reach out to your yeah. targeted audience? Thank you. Uh, you're, you're from BU. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Lisa Kelly, and I'm a sophomore in CAS. Good, very good. Uh, Chris, you have uh, another question? I'm just highly concerned with that question. Uh, uh, just a question uh, between the uh, internet diplomacy and the censorship. Uh, and the censorship mm -hmm. of the government, because I'm from China, and the, our government just blocked the uh, uh, Facebook and several bloggers, uh, Twitter, something like that. But we can also see the progress that our government and the uh, communication between U.S. Uh, U.S. citizens and Chinese citizens have made. Uh, recently, I uh, I saw that uh, the U.S. embassy in Beijing have set up an account in uh, Xinlan Weibo. It's like a Twitter in China. And also uh, some uh, U US uh, celebrities uh, have set up their accounts in the uh, set up uh, several blogs uh, in Chinese website. Uh, uh, I also hear that uh, the fa the founder of Facebook also negotiate with the Chinese uh, businessmen and political leaders to um, like revive the Facebook in China or uh, to find a way out that face uh, in what situation that situ uh, Facebook can came back to China. So how do you see this back and forth and uh, progress and obstacle between the? Uh, the internet uh, diplomacy and the censorship of the government. Okay, thank, thank you. you. If we can take, um, we have a few more. Sure, we have time. If, uh, can you sure. ask another question? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll go as quickly as I can. Um, so I I mentioned earlier, you know, like the breakdown of the traditional narrative shaping, um, and you said that in the modern era, you know, there's a conflict between what you say and what's happening, but I I feel like that's not really part of the modern era. You know, because even something like Iran Contra, you know, that was a huge gap between words and actions, and that was broken by the regular media, because back then the regular media was the only media. Um, you know, and Watergate and all kinds of scandals. That's uh, I I don't think what I what I meant to talk about or what I was trying to say is that there's so much peer to peer communication, and there's so many loops that people get into. I mean, you know, you're from Europe. Uh, let's say I'm some sort of Euro skeptic. Uh, on the margins of Europe, but you know, I'm I'm not interested in the European Union. I hate it. But you're trying to convince me uh, that it's good because you're you know a member of a European government. I'm never going to read your press releases. I'm never going to read the mainstream media. I'm going to hang out on the internet in chat rooms, forums, and blogs of other Euroskeptics, and we're going to talk until dawn about how much we hate the European Union. So, but that manifests itself in so many ways. How can governments or anyone? break through these bubbles, because I feel like there are a lot of them. And uh, I mean, I, I hope I'm not in any of them. But even if you, if you spend any time on the internet, you can see where they are. So I think that's a real challenge. I was wondering how you would react okay, to that. Thank you. Uh, um, Ambassador Dunbar, no, Charles, no, no, did you have a no, question? No, oh. it's on another totally different OK, okay Please, right. Go ahead. Um, can we just take one more then from uh, Eric in the back? Is, do you, um, my question was sort of related to censorship. Um, while the uh, United States advocates the free press and uh, things like that, I read recently that there was a study done by, I think, Harvard, that um, a lot of the countries that uh, e the, the technology they use to censor the press are provided by American businesses. And I was wondering what the role of the United States government, if anything, should be in 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 that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, who would like to take that initiative? Paul? I can't take that one. I can talk about yeah. the blogging one. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it may be that I'm, it's a sign of my age, but I don't actually care what they say uh, in the blogosphere. I don't, I, I, you know, I was offered a blog at the organization I work at, and I, 
and they said, you can get reaction, you know, people will, you'll, you'll get feedback on what you're saying. Have you, ever, have you ever read the feedback that you get when you write an op-ed piece? <laughs> Who would want that? David Ignatius doesn't read any of this. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't read that at all. And I don't really care very much if there are people who love the European Union or hate the European Union or so long as what they're, you know, so long as the issue is not whether it's criminal or not, you know, their intent, then I don't think it's, it's something I need to care very much about. And I don't think if I would, and I'm not in government, but if I were in government, I wouldn't care very much about it. I would, I would just say this is, this is just a, you know, not of interest unless somebody can show me that the great agglomeration of comment somehow can be extruded down to show that there, these are trends that are going on in, 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 the, you know, in the country, in the world. Otherwise, I, don't, I wouldn't really care what people thought or said to each other. Any well, I think, I mean, on the, on the Eurosceptic piece, um, if you tell me, well, you know, that's directly linked to what happened in Finland this past weekend, hmm, yes, well, okay, then that's, you know, then that's, that's, a, that's a question. I mean, are they in a majority power? No. Is that part of the democratic system that, you know, depending on how you have designed your democratic system, you'll get, you know, parties that play a role in national decision making? Yes. The, the Eurosceptic piece, I'm not so worried about. What you know, whether when it's when it's again, you know, the chat rooms that ultimately uh, convince uh, people to go into training camps elsewhere and start, you know, uh, radicalizing young minds and those kind of things. That's an issue, right? And start having a, an impact on um, the entire sort of global landscape. Um, and and, and, that, and that's, I mean, this is. So far, I'm not sure there is that, you know, uh, wonderful golden solution bar, you know, State Departments elsewhere trying to be just as loud um, as, you know, or just as interesting or just as flashy or just as whatever, capturing um, in, and, and, and imagination building as these things. Mm, can a government ever do that? Hmm. This, I mean, we had this discussion about um, what, you know, what other actors can potentially a government harness for these kind of, you know, is there room there for other non-governmental actors? Um, I'm very, I'm personally very skeptical of, of, of governments trying to harness other, you know, or co-opt other actors for its purposes and then, you know, to create a crutch when it's not ready to do specific, specific things. I'm not sure I have a very, you know, direct answer. I mean, I think right now what we're seeing is that governments are just then trying to uh, be louder, be flashier, be better, be quicker, be whatever, um, or to start earlier, right? I mean, if you think about what goes on in terms of migrant integration programs, um, democrat sort of um, engaging different groups with different cultural backgrounds um, when they arrive in a country to make sure that they're incorporated in a Western value system, those kind of things, so that they're, you know, they're, they don't fall prey to radicalization, economic exclusion, those kind of things that prompt people to hang out in chat rooms until 4 o'clock in the morning because they have nothing else to do, because they have no job, they have no X, Y, or Z uh, other responsibilities. Um, I'm talking now specifically about um, radicalization issues, not about your Eurosceptic uh, chat room, because I, I kind of agree with Paul, you know, in some way, in some ways, let people have their opinions and find find like-minded uh, uh, people elsewhere, as long as it doesn't have these sort of really um, disruptive effects. Um, I'm going to say two things just about censorship. Um, it, this idea of uh, sort of t turning things on and off uh, begins to create um, what other people have described as the sort of the dictator's dilemma, right? Because when you're turning things on, suddenly you get sort of glimpses of other people's thinking on issue X or Y, and then you start to begin to question, well, is that true or is that not true? And then, you know, and then it gets turned off. So you're putting yourself in it by sort of, I spent a, a long time, or uh, I spent four or five months in China um, just ahead of the Olympic Games. And I used to work for CNN International, and in fact, I used to uh, produce CNN Asia shows out of Atlanta um, that, that were produced in Hong Kong. And so then when I was traveling around China, clearly I was in, in Western westernized hotels, and every time you know there was a controversial report on CNN about the Olympic Games, boom, the television would go black. And I would sort of say, oh, this is interesting. I, I hardly noticed that this happened. You know, I mean, okay, but I'm in an international hotel, so clearly this is what I'm seeing. I'm not watching uh, CCTV. I'm not, wa you know, so um, I'm not in an in an average Chinese household where that, you know, that sort of censorship or or um, 
or the way that news or facts are portrayed are, are different, right? I mean, that censorship is so blatantly obvious that, um, you know, when the television goes black and then two minutes later when we're talking about Australia, the thing comes back on. Um, I, I find your point about um, U.S. companies uh, financing that uh, very interesting. I'd love to investigate that and look into that um, and be very interested in hearing where you heard that um, or picked that up. I think, you know, ultimately this is what China is, is wondering, right? I think one of the greatest questions that has now come out is, you know, can, can Tahrir Square, um, you know, can we, is, will we have, see somewhere a replay of Tiananmen uh, in, in, in 89, is this a wave? What do we do? How can we control this? Can we control this? And I mean, the Chinese government has worked long and hard in terms of finding a very nuanced way of, of, of allowing uh, economic openness and prosperity and growth and uh, an influx of certain, certainly certain um, Western tokens of growth within the society and is now trying to figure out just how it can modulate that and how it, but how it can still sort of keep that, that lid on. Um, you know, how long will, I mean, you're a much better judge of, 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 of what goes on on the ground there. I mean, like I said, I've been in, in China in, in, in almost two years now. But I mean, I thought, I thought that was interesting. And I think this idea of having a dictator's dilemma is, is, is true. Because you're, you know, then if you're a part of that kind of government, you're consistently going to have to ask yourself, how do I keep the lid on? And, and how much can I keep the lid on if I keep turning things on and off? Come in on the sure. democracy promotion thing. I just wanted to quickly, I mean, uh, on the question of promoting democracy in places that don't have access to the internet. So I think the point that you already raised about cell phones is extremely important there. But I would also go back to TV. Uh, there is not a single village in Africa where there is not a TV in the bar. There is not a single village in the kind of poorest parts of Latin America where there is not a TV in the bar. Uh, every cafe in the Middle East has a TV tuned to Al Jazeera, Al Manir, et cetera. I think TV remains a profoundly influential source of imagery, of perception, of values, of information. Um, so those two things together. But the other point I want to make is but take on what you said about promoting democracy. Well, let's be clear. The vast amount of U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy is not promoting democracy. Promoting democracy is a small sub-activity of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we sometimes do it. We sometimes mean it. Uh, but it's certainly not the main thing that we do. We protect our interests. We try to solve global problems. We do humanitarian things. We do commercial things. We do lots of things. Promoting democracy is a small subset of them. I just had a country where I have some experience, Cuba, has, I think, recently accepted that you know, they can't block um, access to the internet. I mean, they simply can't block the spread of the internet. They have one of the lowest um, access rates through costs, through technology in the world. But now they're accepting that uh, we have to have it for obviously reasons of communication. Uh, and we have to accept that we'll have our own bloggers. A government, uh, a totalitarian government, will create its own blogs. There's the, the warfare now in the blogosphere. And interestingly enough, there are strong signs that they are uh, collaborating with the Chinese government on, on, on just that, with their vast expertise. So it, it's obviously a forum and a, a medium that you know, governments now accept uh, can have host, hostile implications for them, but it's not something that can be ignored. So you have to be out there battling and getting your message and, and trying your best to, to control it. But it, nobody's quite worked it out yet, and I think this is one of the fascinating areas of the subject. Um, do we have time? I know people have flights to catch. If there is one more question, um, or... That, that no, woman there has been trying to answer, did, ask a question. Yes, yes. one more question? Yeah. <laughs> She's had her hand up several right, times. Right, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm Angela, I'm from the German right. Consulate. Right. Uh, I was just want to say, uh, uh, I'm Chinese, but two months ago I was in Beijing, and uh, in China we don't have Facebook. And we don't have Twitter, but uh, we have a website called the People People website. And uh, so two months ago, they will have a demonstration organized by this website. And uh, there are 13 cities at the same time have this demonstration uh, about inflation, about the government, everything. But uh, in fact, there are less Chinese people than the West people were there in the demonstration. And the US ambassador were there, just a coincident. <laughs> and uh, so the point, what I want to say is, uh, so even the website in China organized the people to show the demonstration, and, uh, but it's different from the uh, Libya, Iran. The people 
maybe in that country, they know what they want. They know what they want to do now. But in China, since the economy is important for the priority for the people, so even everyone want to go there, but uh, uh, no one want to go there. So the Chinese people, they didn't go there, and the Western media, they were there. So mm -hmm. finally, the government caught them. Mm -hmm. And they ask uh, who organized that. So since the, the American ambassador were there, and they thought maybe he organized mm -hmm. the whole thing. So I just want to give that, that John Hanson, kind of the comments it? about that. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody? <laughs> the only thing I would comment on that is, um, having lived in several different uh, countries and watched them interpreting American foreign policy, I'm always struck by this, that international commentators on American foreign policy always ascribe to the United States vastly more sophistication than it actually exists. There is no way that John Huntsman was smart enough or that his team that was capable enough to pull that off. There's just no way. Uh, and none of the things that get attributed in this way to kind of the manipulations of American power in Egypt or whatever, the United States can barely organize an interagency meeting between the Defense Department and the CIA and the State Department effectively, let alone the kind of sophisticated penetration that we see elsewhere. But I think that the United States actually misses a trick by not being more transparent about its own dysfunctionality. Uh, <laughs> because if it would let people in to see how dysfunctional it actually is, it would be somewhat less threatening of people internationally and we might get better results. One last comment I can make on so something similar to that, and that is someone was worried in the audience about uh, the, the, you know, the use by governments of uh, uh, social media to influence other populations. Uh, most governments don't begin to have a sufficiently sophisticated comprehension of other societies that they can effectively uh, subvert that kind of a population, unless it's really operating on the level of, uh, you know, sort of high principle, because they just they just don't know enough. They don't know what's what clangs. They don't know what works. They don't know when they're saying something that's counterproductive. They just don't know, and and for the most part they're probably better off not to try. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I hope uh, you found an interesting session. It just remains for me to thank on behalf of Boston University and on behalf of the Party Center our participants in this task force. We worked them very hard. I know um, they have flights to catch. So um, Ambassador Paul Heinbecker from Wilfrid Laurier uh, University in Canada, former uh, Canadian ambassador to the United Nations in Germany, um, Ambassador Nicholas Burns, who is here with us this morning, but as I explained, uh, is doing some real world diplomacy this afternoon from Professor of Practice of Diplomacy, International Politics at Harvard University, uh, Dr. Catherine Kluver, Executive Director of the Future of Diplomacy Project uh, at the Belfer Center, Harvard University, uh, Professor Dr. Bruce Jones, who's Director and Senior Fellow of the NYU Center on International Cooperation and Senior Fellow and Director of the Managing Global Insecu uh, Insecurity Program at the Brookings Institution. Um, Professor J.P. Singh, Associate Professor at the Graduate Program in Communication, Culture and Technology at Georgetown University. Professor Paul Sharp, Professor of Political Science and Diplomacy at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And we earlier had the uh, input to and expertise of <coughs> Professor Bob Zelnick, who, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is Professor of Journalism here at BU, Professor of National and International Affairs. So thank you all again for coming. Thank you on my personal behalf to all the staff at the Party Center, to uh, Cynthia Barakat and Ahmet Tegelio, who's doing a record of this uh, occasion. And we hope it will lead to other um, projects, other occasions to, to draw on what we've, we've uh, discussed today. So thank you again for coming. And um, stay focused on diplomacy. It's an exciting subject. <laughs> <laughs>